Okay, so welcome back to the CS 492D uh, Diffusion Models and their Applications. Uh, so we're gonna uh, basically continue our discussions about some applications of the pre-trained uh, diffusion models. So last time we discussed the idea in terms of the score distillation sampling, uh, which is basically extending the capabilities of the pre-trained diffusion model in a way to generate not only some kind of the uh, some the data that has been uh, designed basically uh, for the diffusion models to produce, but also producing some many other types of the data. Uh, for example, like for the image diffusion models, we are basically uh, extending its, the capability uh, to produce like 3D uh, and, and also many other things like panoramic images and many other things. And for that, the basic idea uh, was to basically uh, utilize the framework of the 3D reconstruction, but basically not minimizing the L2 loss uh, with the given images from the different views, but basically running the back propagation through the loss function uh, that has been used for the diffusion model training. And through this kind of the great descent kind of the approach, uh, basically updating the given the 3D representation from the multiple views, uh, we could get some very different, uh, some kind of the 3D the outputs. And this was basically good because like there are not many kind of the, uh, some kind of large scale the 3D data set, but without basically training some kind of the general model uh, directly for the 3D data, uh, basically we could basically do some kind of the 3D generation by using the 2D image, the, image, the generation, uh, the capabilities of the diffusion models. So this was the basic idea for the SDS. And what can you generate using the SDS? Uh, there can be many kinds of things that we could basically consider generating using the, the SDS. And obviously we can also generate the images as well. So while the standard way for the image generation uh, using the diffusion models would be basically uh, running the reverse process, uh, we can also uh, try to basically use the SDS for the image generation. And that was also the, the part of the assignment for, right? So if we consider basically doing some kind of the image generation using the SDS, then that would be the case that you know, we are basically uh, making the rendering the function uh, in the, the loss function uh, into the basically the identity function. So basically the, the things that we are going to update uh, should be something that we are basically generating using the diffusion models, right? And instead of like running the uh, reverse process, uh, we are basically running the back propagation through the loss function. Then if it comes to basically doing some kind of the image generation, then what would be kind of the difference between running the reverse process and the SDS, right? So that was also the things that we uh, have discussed last time. So for the image generation, basically we can consider running some kind of the reverse process, uh, but for many other the cases, like the, for the 3D generation, uh, the reason like why, why we basically considered uh, running the SDS instead of the reverse the, the process uh, is that basically now the data are basically represented uh, not as some kind of the pixel the colors, but as kind of the rendering of the 3D some kind of representations. Uh, which means that while we basically produce the images uh, from the, each of the view in the same way as basically we generate some kind of images using the reverse process, uh, the way that the, the data point is basically represented uh, is basically changed. So basically the, now the data is basically parameterized as some kind of the rendering of the 3D representation. So we cannot directly run the reverse process uh, into the, some kind of the parameterization that we are using. So our the parameterization is basically some 3D parameters plus some kind of rendering in the 3D generation case. Uh, so for this kind of the case, since we cannot directly run the reverse process uh, for this specific representation, uh, we are basically utilizing the, uh, the projection function, which is the rendering equation in a way that we can uh, use some kind of the some great descent uh, through the, uh, the loss function. And also what we want to achieve, especially for the 3D degeneration, uh, the case is that uh, while we are basically uh, still basically generating images from the different views, uh, we want to basically get some kind of the consistent outputs, right? So we don't want that you know, all the images like generating from the different views are basically completely some different images for the like different objects, but basically images for the same object uh, in terms of like getting some kind of the consistency uh, across the old views. So as the way to basically make some kind of the consistent the outputs, uh, we are basically doing some kind of the uh, the you know, iterative the update uh, for each of the view uh, in a way that we get some kind of the more uh, the constant the outputs. And what were the, also the limitations of the SDS? Uh, since, since we are basically uh, generating some kind of data, not using the reverse process, but through this kind of the back propagation, uh, one of the limitations was that uh, sometimes we get some kind of the slightly less realistic the outputs. 
and, and also uh, it becomes also harder to basically converge. So especially if you want to see some kind of the convergence uh, in the iterate the update, uh, the one way that we could do was basically increasing the uh, the classified free guidance the weights uh, in terms of that we are basically also uh, compromising the diversity uh, to get some kind of the, some converged outputs in the generation. So here the question is that like you know, why we are basically you know, introducing the SDS to produce some kind of the some other types of the, the data uh, using some kind of pre-trained uh, deep feature models. Uh, would there be some kind of the ways to also use some kind of the, the typical diversity process uh, to produce some kind of the various the types of the data uh, without using this core display and the sampling? So this is basically the idea that we are going to discuss for today. Uh, any questions on the SDS before we move on to the topic? So yeah, so the next assignment uh, will be basically replacing the SDS with some kind of the joint uh, reverse process uh, in a way they can also produce some kind of the other types of the data. So before we talk, start to talk about the idea about some kind of joint uh, division the process, uh, let me first basically introduce some kind of the terminology. Uh, so basically we are going to consider some kind of the two spaces, like one is the, basically the canonical space and the other one is the instance space. And basically the canonical space is the space where we are basically generating some kind of the data that we want to see. Uh, so for example, for some kind of the panoramic images, uh, we can consider some kind of the long canvas of the image. And now that long canvas becomes the, our the space, the canonical space where we are basically generating the uh, final the output of the basically the data. And for example, for this kind of the, the mesh textures, uh, the texture, the the domain, the texture image, uh, the the uh, the space uh, becomes our the basically the canonical space where we are basically aggregating all the informations from the across the different views. Right? Uh, and then we are also having the instance spaces uh, where, where basically the space that you know, the, our the pre-trained feature model is generating some kind of data point. So typically what we do is that we are having some kind of the multiple views of the images uh, for either some kind of the 3D representation or some kind of the, some, the canvas or the panoramic images. And then basically uh, putting this kind of the images that we are generating in the instance spaces uh, towards the basically this kind of the canonical space. So basically, this is the setup that we are assuming some kind of the given the mapping uh, between the canonical and the instance spaces. Uh, we're gonna call the mapping from the canonical space to the instance space as kind of the projection. And this was actually the rendering uh, in the previous state context when we are switching the term into the projection. So the mapping from the canonical to the instance spaces uh, becomes the projection the mapping. And we're gonna also call the other way around, uh, the mapping from the instance space uh, to the canonical space as kind of the unprojection, the operation. So those are kind of the given setup that we are having the two spaces, canonical space and the instance space, and having the mapping between them. And one becomes the projection from the canonical to the instance space and the unprojection from the instance to the canonical spaces. And given this kind of a setup, like, can you come up with some kind of the applications? Uh, what would be some kind of the setup that uh, the, the cases that will basically require this kind of a setup, like having the two spaces? Any thoughts on this? So 3D generation might be one setup for this, uh, but there would there be some other the applications for this setup. Uh, do you have any thoughts on this? Please post the answer in the Slack channel.
okay, we can think about like many applications that we can uh, basically generate some kind of data points uh, using this setup, uh, not only for some kind of the image, video, and 3D things, but also many other things. Well, some of the applications that we are going to see for today is that like the first the application uh, is the, obviously panoramic images. Uh, for the panoramas, the, the thing is that uh, while we are seeing some many kind of the pre-trained some image diffusion models that can generate some kind of images in the some certain resolution, uh, you can see that those like diffusion models are basically limited uh, to produce the images in the very specific resolution, like 512 by 512 or like you know, seven, you know, 68 by 768, as you can see uh, in, in, in this slide. So if you want to basically generate some kind of the images in the very arbitrary scale, uh, where if we want to generate some kind of the 360 the panoramic the images, uh, we need to have some kind of the, some dedicated uh, diffusion models for them. So here the question is that can you just like produce any the images in any scale and any size uh, using the pre-trained uh, diffusion models that can only produce some kind of square sized images. And for that, we can consider having the like uh, defining the canonical and the instance spaces in a way that uh, we are defining the canonical space as kind of the some long the canvas and also the instance spaces as some kind of the some small region uh, inside that the space. And also the mesh texturing can be like the one option for that. Uh, the, the, so here basically the texture image is basically some kind of the 2D image that is basically like wrapped over the given the 3D the mesh surface in a way that they can define some kind of the some color, the appearance information uh, of the 3D the geometry. So this is like very typical some kind of a setup in the computer graphics in terms of the, you know, the shape is represented as some kind of the mesh or some kind of 3D representation while basically define some kind of the 2D image that is basically like uh, wrapped over the 3D surface in a way that, that defines some kind of the color information. And if you see many kind of like 3D models in the, some 3D online the repositories, you can see that many of the models are basically, uh, you know, uh, provided uh, using only some kind of the mesh information without having some kind of the good quality of the texture information. So using the same setup, we can consider generate some kind of the mesh textures, uh, given some kind of the 3D mesh. Uh, so for those kind of the case, like the, the canonical space becomes the texture, the image space. Uh, and then the instance space becomes some kind of the secure image space uh, that is basically unprojected uh, into the texture space through some kind of the, the mapping to, from the 2D to 3D. And the other way around, basically the projection becomes the lander in the equation. And this is also the another example, uh, which might be kind of the interesting to see. Uh, so when we talk about the ambiguous images, basically the ambiguous image is the image that can be interpreted uh, in the multiple ways based on some kind of these transformations. So as you can see on the first uh, the image, uh, the you know, Einstein the image uh, is basically converted into the, some plant images uh, while basically doing some kind of the shuffling of the, the puzzles, right? And also the second image is basically like the painting of the man and if you basically rotate uh, the image, then it also becomes the uh, painting of some kind of people at the, the campfire, right? And the last one is also the image uh, with some kind of the plants. And then after some kind of the transformation, now we are seeing some uh, the, the landscape like this. So those are some kind of the ambiguous images. And what would be basically the canonical, the inst and the instant spaces for those kind of the cases? Any thoughts on this? So also for those kind of the ambiguous the images, the canonical space also becomes the instant space, the image space, and the instant space also becomes the same the image space. So those are some kind of examples that we are having the same space, uh, both as the canonical space and the instant space, uh, but the mapping between these two are defined in this specific way. So you know, basically, as you can see on the left-hand side, uh, the some kind of puzzle, the, the shuffling becomes some kind of the mapping becomes the instance space to the canonical space. So we can basically consider that we are having some kind of the multiple the instances of the images uh, that, is, that is basically mapped to the, like one of them that becomes our the canonical basically space uh, through some kind of the specific mapping, uh, some kind of the transformations across them. Uh, another kind of like similar example is the zooming videos. So let me play this again. So starting from the universe and then going into the planet 
uh, now we are zooming in more, uh, seeing some kind of the some structure uh, over the, the plane, right? So let me play this again. So this is also kind of some kind of video that is generated using some kind of pre-trained uh, image diffusion model, which is basically uh, having some kind of the multiple the images uh, that are basically smoothly transited uh, into the some kind of zoom in the image. Uh, image is some kind of the uh, way to basically uh, you know combine these things. And you can see that we are basically seeing this kind of a transition from the uh, universe image into some kind of a structure image, uh, while basically generating some multiple images with some kind of the different the prompts, uh, as you can see on the right hand side. So this is kind of like the similar the case that we are having the both the uh, the canonical the, and the instant space as some kind of the image space, basically the same space, uh, while basically defining the, the mapping across them as some kind of the, some zooming and zooming out uh, the operations. So this can be also another big example. And this idea can be applied not only for some kind of the image and the video generation, but also many other things. Uh, for example, like for the typical some kind of the motion uh, digital models, uh, those kind of the diffusion models are basically generating the motions in the certain the time sequence, like the 10 seconds or some, like some number of the frames. And for those kind of the cases, uh, if we want to basically elongate uh, basically the length of the some kind of motion, uh, while using some kind of the some pre-trained diffusion models for the certain the range of the uh, the time, the, the range of the motion, uh, we can consider basically having some kind of the longer the time sequence, uh, we, which becomes the our the canonical space, and then dividing this into the multiple the instant spaces uh, in a way that we can basically apply the same kind of the idea uh, for some kind of synchronization. And you can basically you know, uh, imagine that we can also apply the same idea, not only for the motion, but many other things like image and the video, like audio or something. So there can be uh, lots of the applications for that. Any questions on this? So let me briefly go over the idea about the diffusion synchronization. So this is basically uh, nothing but basically running some kind of the diffusion, the reverse process through the uh, multiple the instance spaces. So let me first start with some kind of the very simple the example, uh, which is making some kind of the arbitrary decided images. And so for that, we are going to assume that we are having the canonical space uh, for the longer the image the canvas, and then basically having some kind of the uh, instant spaces uh, with the scaled image size. And if we basically work on some kind of the latent diffusion models, uh, this will be basically the same the case because you know, as you as we have discussed in the last time, uh, latent diffusion model is also mapping the some kind of the high resolution the image into the low resolution some kind of the latent image. So for example, like the A image with the 512 by the 512 the resolution uh, will be mapped to the low resolution, the latent image, which is like 64 by 64 uh, with some kind of the, some higher the dimension, like the four in this case. So we can also think about that we are also defining the, the canonical space and the instant space uh, in the, with some kind of the latent space. So we are having some kind of the longer the latent space uh, with some kind of the, some you know, higher, some kind of the, the, the length for the specific dimension, and then also having some kind of this, uh, the square size of the latent base space. And we specifically define the, the mapping through the canonical and the instant spaces, uh, while basically having some multiple instances that are basically mapped to some kind of the overwrapped regions. So as you can see, we are basically uh, having some kind of the multiple, some kind of the regions, uh, some sub-regions over the canonical space, uh, while basically having some kind of the overlaps uh, across the all the instances. And in this specific the example, the projection uh, from the canonical space to the instant space uh, becomes the cropping. Uh, so if you basically crop some kind of the region, uh, that becomes basically uh, the mapping from the canonical to the instant spaces. Is it clear? So for this kind of a setup, like what we can do uh, in terms of like doing some kind of the some uh, synchronization across the some kind of the, the diffusion the process uh, is to basically simply average some kind of data, uh, the noise data, especially in the overlap region. So basically what we are going to do is that when you have this kind of the multiple the instances of the images, uh, we are going to simply basically run the reverse of the process uh, for each of the instance image. So we are starting from the X capital T, uh, the basically the Gaussian, the unique Gaussian the sample, 
uh, for each of the instance based images. And then basically running the reverse process while basically averaging the noise data point uh, in the open region. So if we basically recall the DDIM, the, the DDIM the reverse the process, uh, as we are basically seeing multiple times uh, the same thing. So basically uh, in the deterministic sampling, uh, for each of the step, we are basically calculating these three quantities, right? So given the XT, uh, using the noise deep prediction the network, uh, we are basically getting the epsilon T, which is the basically the, uh, the score uh, each, each of the case. And based on that, we predict the final the output, the X0, uh, the best prediction from the X, XT, right? Uh, using the epsilon T here. And based on that, now we are basically sampling the XT minus one, right? So we are basically having these kind of three quantities. So what we are going to do is that while we are basically computing those three things uh, from the each of the frame for each of the instance the image, uh, after basically getting the XT minus one, uh, we are averaging this like XT minus one in the overlap region. Uh, in a way that we are basically some doing some kind of a synchronization uh, across the images. So this is like very simple the idea. Uh, let's see or like what we get. And before we see basically what we get through this kind of the, the operation, uh, what happens if we do not average the XT? So if we basically run the reverse process like all basically uh, the independently across the all the instant the, the, the spaces, uh, what would be kind of the opposite that we're gonna see? Uh, Yeah, so what we're gonna basically see is that, uh, for example, like when you have some kind of a prompt, like the snow mountains with some kind of the houses under the, the mountains, then we can see some kind of the, some kind of variations of the images. And if we see some like all the variations across the, all the different the, the instance, the images, uh, we're gonna basically see some kind of the discontinuity, like the seams of the images, right? So typically without the, uh, the averaging, uh, this will be some kind of the some outputs that we expect to see. Uh, while like each of the instance space uh, is basically the following the, the given the prompt, uh, there is basically the same across the images as you can see here, right? But if we basically average the XT every the step of the kind of the denoising the process, then the interesting thing is that uh, surprisingly, it basically makes some kind of the much smoother the outputs. So this is the case, like that we are denoising all over time. And as we basically get you know, T to get to be zero, then we're gonna see that those kind of the outputs. So this is kind of very surprising the output, right? I mean, so without doing anything, like when you do some kind of the average of the XT, uh, basically we are right now seeing some kind of the outputs that there is no sim, but like all the basically the, the regions of the basically the long the canvas is basically following the given the prompt, right? And you know, you're gonna basically, you know, we'll try those things in your DL75. And you're gonna say that actually it's basically giving some kind of interesting the outputs like this and some kind of more the outputs. And given this kind of the idea of like basically you know, combining some kind of the multiple the instance the images, uh, can you also come up with uh, like, you know, how we can also generate some kind of images that follow some kind of the given the layout? So this is like the example that we are providing this kind of the layout as some kind of the input uh, into our the system uh, in a way that we are giving some kind of the different prompt. Uh, so the previous case was basically using the same prompt for the all the instant images. And now we are basically having this kind of layout uh, and the black region is corresponding to the A photo and the green region is corresponding to the A balloon. And also we have having the ethyl tower and the pink cloud, right? So given this kind of layout, if we want to produce some kind of the composition, the all the objects in the scene, uh, what should they do? Using the idea that we just discussed.
Yeah, so we can basically define the uh, the the mapping from the instance space to the canonical space in a way that the instance images are basically defined for each of the region uh, for the uh, pink and green, green and the blue the regions, while we are also having the instance spaces for the black region as well. And then we are running the joint, the reverse process jointly across the, all the instance spaces uh, while basically averaging the XT, the, the noisy data point. So what we can basically see is that now we can apply the same idea, like synchronizing the diffusion process uh, while even basically taking the different basically condition uh, for each of the instance images, right? Then we can see this kind of the interesting, some kind of the outputs, like the compositing some multiple the objects uh, in the scene. So this would be basically some interesting the example that without doing nothing, but basically when you do some kind of the averaging of the uh, some the noise data point, uh, surprisingly the uh, the uh, the stable diffusion, basically some image diffusion models can produce uh, those kind of some, some kind of the seamless the outputs, the panoramic the images. But then would it work uh, for all the applications that we discussed before? So what if we also consider some other the applications, then what will happen? So these are basically the things that, you know, some kind of the practical the aspects. Uh, but basically what we are gonna see is that uh, if we start to consider some other types of the panoramic images, like the 360 the panoramic images. So this is basically the case that we are capturing the entire the scene uh, along the 360 the degree uh, the, all the basically the angles uh, in a way that all the images are basically now mapped uh, over the sphere. So we can think about that the entire the scene uh, in the 3D the space uh, is basically mapped uh, into the images over the sphere. Then basically the uh, the uh, the image from that a specific specific view uh, can be considered as some kind of the cropping some region uh, over the sphere like this. Right? And if we basically flatten basically uh, the sphere uh, while basically making some kind of the, some crack over the sphere, and we can also basically try to map uh, the image over the sphere into the, some kind of the rectangular image like this, uh, while basically having some kind of the distortion uh, in the space, right? Uh, so as you can see, the images at the bottom are also basically some 360 panoramic images after flattening the sphere uh, into the basically the flat the plane. You can see some kind of the indoor images with some kind of the, some distortion uh, with some kind of the curves here, right? So this is basically the same setup. We are basically having some kind of the long canvas uh, of the, for the canonical space and also the square size of the, the image uh, for the instant space. Uh, but for this kind of the case, uh, if we think about the mapping the, the on projection from the instant space to the canonical space, uh, it will basically no longer basically having some kind of a square region. Uh, in the canonical space, but basically having some kind of the distorted uh, squares like this. So you can see that this uh, red rectangle, uh, uh, the red square, uh, the instance image is mapped to this kind of the, some, uh, some distorted uh, some region uh, in the, the panoramic image, right? And the other things are basically the same. So this will be basically the setup that we are basically mapping the pixel uh, in the instance space uh, into some kind of the, some, some point uh, in the canonical space. But now what we are going to say is that it won't be basically some kind of the one-to-one -one mapping across the pixels. So if we consider like one pixel uh, in the instance space, and now it will start to basically be mapped to the one of the point uh, in the canonical space, but basically not falling into the center of the pixel in the canonical space, but mapped to some kind of the arbitrary point uh, in a way that uh, basically all the basically pixels in the canonical space should be basically interpolated uh, with some kind of the neighbor, the pixels, which are basically mapped uh, from the instant spaces. So if we consider some kind of operation of the on projection from the instant space to the canonical space, uh, those, will be the, uh, those will basically be the case that uh, this will basically involve some kind of the interpolation. So if we want to basically calculate the, the pixel color at this point in the canonical space, uh, since there is no basically a uh, single the point, the pixel in the instant space, which is like mapped to this specific point, uh, what we need to do is that uh, we need to basically have the four the neighbor the pixels uh, coming from the instant spaces uh, and then basically uh, interpolating them, right? So basically what we can see is that uh, this is the setup that the projection and the unprojection basically involve some kind of the interpolation. So for those kind of the cases, like if uh, we start to see that 
actually this idea, like you no know, uh, averaging the x t, uh, the the noise data point, uh, is not working well in terms of the now we start to see some kind of the unrealistic the outputs like this. Uh, so you can see that now some of the colors here become some kind of the some uh some you know constant the colors uh, without basically losing some kind of the reality in the outputs. And if you also think about some kind of the mesh texturing, uh, this will be basically the same the case that you know the projection and the unprojection basically involve some kind of the uh some interpolation, and then we start to see some kind of the some poor the outputs like this. So here the question is that how we can improve some kind of the uh, realism uh, in the output uh, the images uh, and also some kind of the, some, uh, the 3D representations uh, while using some kind of the same synchronization, the idea. So these are some kind of the improved, the, uh, improved the outputs uh, using some kind of different approach for the uh, synchronization and also some kind of the mesh texturing the outputs here. Compared to the previous results, now we can see that the output is much more the realistic. Uh, if you also know about the Gaussian splits, uh, this is some kind of the another representation for this 3D. And for those kind of representation, uh, we can also apply some kind of color information here uh, using the synchronization the idea. So let's get back to some kind of the, the general idea uh, for the synchronization. So this was basically the setup that we are having the canonical space and also basically having some kind of the mapping from the instance space to the canonical space uh, with some kind of the overlaps. So we uh, this is like specific the example, like making some kind of texture images over this 3D shape. And when you, uh, what we call as some kind of the synchronization uh, is basically the uh, a set of the, the operations that we are basically uh, unprojecting some information defined over the instance space uh, into the, our the canonical space and averaging the information like unprojected uh, into the canonical space, uh, basically over the, basically averaging those information over the canonical space and then projecting this back into the instance space. So this will be basically the basic kind of the operation in terms of uh, uh, doing some kind of a synchronization. And what we have discussed last time is that uh, when you have some kind of the multiple, this kind of the reverse process uh, from the multiple the instance the, the images, uh, we are basically doing some kind of the synchronization for the x t minus one here, right? So for each of the frame, uh, we are having the x t and compute the epsilon t and the x zero by t using the two of these, and then sampling the x t minus one and then averaging this, right? And will there be some other options for this? Uh, so we are basically going to see some kind of the other options for that, and we're gonna uh, discuss some kind of the two key factors. The first one is basically like what we are going to take the average, what will be basically the information that will be averaged over the canonical space. And the other thing is that what will be basically the space where we are basically conducting the denoising the process. So those are basically two main things. So as we can see in this like the diagram, basically what we can consider uh, for the uh, taking the average operation is that uh, instead of like taking the average operation at the x t minus one, Actually, we can consider like averaging the x0 by t or epsilon t. So those are some, some kind of the intermediate, uh, some kind of the entities that we are calculating uh, for each basically denoising step, right? So we can basically consider changing the entity uh, basically we are, with which we are going to basically take the average in the canonical space. So basically when you change those things, so basically we have some kind of three options uh, in terms of like conducting the synchronization, right? And how about changing the denoising space? So those are basically all the cases that we are conducting the denoising the process uh, in the instance space, right? Then can we like also perform the denoising process in the canonical the space directly? What is the answer for this? Okay, think about like why we were like thinking about like the cases like conducting the denoting process not in the canonical space but in the instance space.
Y es sordo. If we want to conduct the denoising process over the chemical space, then what should we have? So basically, if we want to conduct the denoising process over the chemical space, then we will basically need to have a pre-trained uh, diffusion model that has been trained with the data defined over the canonical space, right? So basically what we are doing here is that uh, without basically training in some kind of the, another the diffusion model that has been like trained for the specific the, the data, uh, we are using basically uh, the pre-trained image diffusion models to produce like many other things, right? So if we think about the case of like generating some kind of the mesh textures, uh, if we want to basically perform the denoising the process over the, uh, the texture, the image domain, the space, then we need to have some kind of diffusion model that has been trained with the texture images, uh, which is also basically defined for the same, the, uh, this radius surface, right? But can we also collect like lots of the images, the texture images, images defined over the same, the, the domain, basically the same, the 3D the surface. No, we don't have such kind of the big data set, right? It's hard to expect to even have some like more than one the texture images uh, that are basically defined on the same this way the surface, right? So basically, we don't have the noise partition the network uh, for the chemical space. So this is the, the basic assumption here. So if we have some kind of the noise partition the network for the chemical space, then we didn't need to run this kind of the joint division. Uh, we could just directly generate all the data from the chemical space. But since now we are assuming that we don't have the noise prediction network, uh, which is trained uh, for the data defined over the chemical space, that's basically why uh, we need to basically uh, have some kind of the, some this kind of detour uh, through the, the instance space, right? Makes sense. So basically this is like all the setup that we are assuming that there's no some kind of the pre-trained diffusion model trained with the panoramic images or the texture images. Uh, no, so in kind of like, we don't have such kind of model we trained with some kind of the large scale data in the chemical space. While we are basically having some kind of the pre-trained uh, diffusion model uh, trained with some kind of the tons of the billions of the images, uh, but basically that are defined in the other space, which is the instant space. So that's why we, are, we cannot basically directly compute the epsilon t here because there's no network for that. Right, makes sense. So instead of like this, what we can consider is that we first project the XT, the noise data point in the chemical space into the instance spaces, uh, the multiple the, the instance spaces that we are basically we know the mapping. And then once we basically have something kind of like the projection, uh, based on that we predict the noise uh, for each of these space. And then unproject this back to the chemical space and then take the average in the chemical space, right? So this can be some kind of the another way that we are basically generating some kind of the data point in the chemical space uh, while basically having this kind of detour uh, through the instant space. So we can go down to instant space through the projection of the XT and then do some noise prediction and unproject epsilon t taking everything here where basically compute the 2 this and also unprojecting 2 this into the chemical space and also just like calculate the xt minus one, sample the xt minus one, and then basically calculate the average here, right? So we are basically having the three more options in terms of like, you know, conducting the synchronization. Does this make sense? We are basically discussing like all different ways that we can do some sort of the synchronization uh, in terms of like, you know, what we are going to take the average in the chemical space and also how we are basically uh, basically run this kind of denoising the process in which space. Uh, so since uh, while we cannot directly run the denoising process in the chemical space, uh, we can basically go down to project XT into the instance space first, uh, do some noise prediction here, and then go up to the chemical space through the on projection, right? So you can think about that we're having some kind of the different sort of the routes that we are basically reaching from the XT in the chemical space uh, into the xt minus one, also in the chemical space. Makes sense. 
So which means that we are basically having the six options, right? Uh, the, the first three are basically simply uh, running the denoising process in the intense piece uh, while taking the average of the either epsilon t or 2 this or the xt uh, in the chemical space. And the other three options are basically running the denoising process in the chemical space, not directly, but through the detour uh, in the, into the instance spaces, while also averaging the uh, either epsilon t or the 2 this or the xt here, right? Six cases. Makes sense. And you can see that actually these two are the identical. So if we go back to the these two D cases, uh, we can see that like taking the average of the xt uh, was basically uh, going back and forth uh, from the here to here. This becomes like the you know, on projection and the average and the projection becomes like synchronization of like xt minus one. And also for the this case, uh, if we on project here and take the average, and then next time step, if we project the xt, then you can see that these two are actually identical. It's like different the diagram for the same thing. So which means that now we are actually having the five cases. Uh, so if we uh, summarize this, uh, depending on like in which space we conduct the denoising and also what we are going to take the average uh, in the chemical space, uh, we can consider like the five cases of this synchronization. And these are also all the cases that we are conducting this synchronization only once. Uh, we can also consider like conducting this synchronization multiple times. So depending on that, we can also consider like the many other the cases, right? So this is like very uh, kind of the uh, recent kind of technique, uh, which is based on kind of the very recent researches for that. Actually, we could say that there are many basically recent work doing these kind of things uh, for the different applications. So for the panoramic image generation, there has been some kind of attempts using the case three, uh, which was the case that we are uh, averaging the xt as we have seen in the previous slide, uh, also conducting the denoising in the instant space. And also the, for the, uh, the ambiguous images, uh, the idea was like using the case four, uh, which was basically uh, averaging the epsilon t uh, while basically conducting denoising the chemical space. And there also has been some kind of the example of basically taking the case five uh, for the mesh texture generation, uh, which was basically the case that averaging the tweet is here. Uh, while conducting the denoising in the chemical space. So I recommend you to check out those kind of some related work uh, in terms of like how people are basically exploring this kind of the idea uh, to, to basically to produce like many other things. So these are all based on the very recent work. Uh, you can see that there are many kind of like interesting things like happening uh, in this domain. So those are basically those are kind of like very simple the idea in terms of basically doing some kind of the communication between the technical space and the instant space. Uh, but you can see that the differences across those kind of the different approaches are basically depending on like where we are conducting the denoising the process and also what's the entity that we are basically taking the average in the technical space. So those are basically the five the options. And here the question would be is that then what should be kind of the best way, right? Uh, what would be kind of the best approach uh, across the, all the applications. So I also recommend you to basically uh, try yourself in terms of like changing those kind of options and see uh, which one gives some kind of the best the outputs. Basically what we can see for many kind of some uh, examples, uh, uh, especially in practice, uh, is that it really depends on the, what is come the, becomes the, uh, some kind of the information uh, that is basically averaged uh, over the chemical space. So we discussed uh, the three options in terms of the entity that we're taking the average, uh, which is based on some of these kind of the, the steps uh, in the denoising process, uh, computing the epsilon t, and also based on that computing the two this and sampling the xt mass on red. Uh, so given these basically three things, uh, what we can see is that uh, if we take the average of the epsilon t, basically the epsilon t was basically, uh, was basically this core information, right? Uh, which is basically corresponding to the information about the direction uh, for the denoising. So if we basically average the basically epsilon t, uh, which becomes basically we are taking the average of the basically direction of the denoising the, uh, the trajectory. So when you basically take some kind of the some averaging of the, the direction of the denoising, 
then we can actually get some kind of results, which is basically uh, resulting in some kind of the very uh, wrong, basically, the directions uh, for the denoising the process, so which means that like, this may not be kind of the best option uh, in terms of conducting the synchronization. Synchronization. So the other option was basically to take the average of the xt, uh, which is basically the, uh, averaging the, the noise data point here, right? And what we can also basically see is that uh, every xt is basically a sample from the, some certain the data distribution, right? So what we could see is that x0 is basically uh, the data, the real data from the real data distribution. And uh, we can consider that xt is also a sample from the perturbed uh, the, the data distribution which means that this should be really a sample for a, some specific D distribution. But if we also start to basically take the average of the xt uh, with some kind of the some uh, on projection and the projection the operation, then the average the xt uh, may not follow the given the, uh, the specific distribution, uh, basically being deviated uh, from the given the, uh, distribution. Then this also basically some kind of the deviated sample can lead to some kind of the suboptimal the outputs in the denoising the process. And this is also the same for the x zero bar t, uh, which is also some kind of the predicted uh, the output, the final the output that we are going to see. So which means that uh, as the x zero bar t follows the 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 target the data distribution, uh, we're gonna get some kind of the good results. But this is not the case that we are not directly basically modifying the xt, but only uh, modifying the x zero bar t, uh, which is used only for basically sampling the xt uh, in this formulation. So as you can see here, what we are basically doing is that uh, after we calculate the x0 of t, uh, based on this information, we only use this information to calculate the xt minus one, uh, sampling the xt here, right? So this while this is also doing some kind of the modification of the trajectory, uh, only basically modifying the x0 of t, uh, basically results in some kind of the minimal the deviation uh, from the given the trajectory. And this is, is basically giving this some kind of the best outputs uh, in the many of the, the applications. So if we uh, compare all the five of the cases, uh, the first three uh, was the case that we are conducting the dynamic process in the internal space. And the next two was basically the case that uh, conducting the denoting process in the chemical space. Uh, you can see that the case two and the case five, uh, these, uh, sorry, let me go back to here. Yeah, these two cases give some kind of the best outputs. So case one and the case four, uh, where the case is that we are taking the average of the epsilon t, uh, which is giving some kind of really bad outputs. And when you also uh, average the xt, which is the noise data point, uh, we are getting some kind of the outputs, but which is not the kind of best output, right? So not very realistic. But instead of like taking the average of the xt, uh, if we take the average of the x0 bar t, which is the tweet is, uh, now we can get some kind of the better results, uh, regardless like which space like we take some kind of the uh, conduct the the denoising the process. Uh, questions? Can you combine all the cases with the instance and canonical space weighting? Uh, I couldn't get like what you mean by the instance and the canonical space weighting. Uh, but we can consider like combining all the cases. So as I mentioned before, like you know, these are also all the cases that we are you know performing the synchronization only once, right? So for each of the cases, like we are uh, doing some kind of the some you know uh, some communication between the instance and the chemical space uh, only once, like doing some like uh, one set of the on projection averaging and, and also the projection. But we can consider like having some multiple the synchronization step uh, in the one the uh, denoising this step, while this may not give some kind of the best outputs. Uh, does it make sense to introduce additional variance after average? Uh, since averaging uh, reduces the variance. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, we can also consider doing some kind of the interesting additional the variance after the, the averaging. So, yeah, but, but, but yeah, so we can consider like adding some kind of the variance uh, after the averaging. But what we can see is that uh, this is basically the setup that we are using the deterministic the sampling. So there is no variation that we are considering for now. Uh, but in some kind of the cases that we are increasing the variance here, then we can also think about how we can also control the variance uh, in this kind of synchronization this setup. Any other questions on this?
So those are some more the outputs. So as you can see, yeah, obviously like averaging the, the direction of the denoising the trajectory uh, does not make sense. I mean, the, you know, when you basically take the average of the directions, we can get some totally different the, the direction uh, in the denoising the process. And then we're gonna get some kind of very random denoise the output as you can see here. Uh, if we average the xt, the noise data point, uh, it still kind of gives some kind of the, some okay the outputs, uh, but still the output is not good because like the xt can be deviated from this some certain the uh, distribution, and the averaging the x zero t uh, is not basically making some kind of the big deviation, but uh, still making some kind of the realistic outputs like this. So we can also compare this kind of the approach in, with some kind of the other the method. We also discussed the SDS. Uh, so we can also still compare this approach with the SDS. And also the other uh, the approach is to the iterative the update. So we also discussed this idea uh, last time, uh, which is basically nothing but basically iteratively basically generating some kind of the images from the different views. So what we can do in this specific case for the texture generation is that uh, once we basically generate the image from the one view, now we can move on to the next view and only fill the missing region uh, over the canonical space, and also move on to the next view and fill the missing regions. And you can repeat uh, this kind of this process, like filling the missing regions uh, while basically iterating over some kind of the different the viewpoints, right? But while this might be kind of the some easier and the kind of the simple the solution, uh, what are the some kind of the expected limitations like this approach? Any thoughts on this? So basically we are filling some kind of regions based on the adjacent views, right? So there is no way that we can achieve some kind of a consistency across the views that are like, you know, far each other, right? And if we also make a loop, like coming back to the original, the, the viewpoint again, uh, then there will be also no way to basically uh, remove the scene uh, with some kind of the, uh, when you just go back to the, uh, the, the first image, right? So basically like this kind of the, uh, method like iteratively like updating the views uh, is basically hard to basically achieve some kind of a consistency uh, of course the views. So if we compare the uh, outputs that we can obtain with the synchronization uh, with some kind of outputs that we can get with the SDS and the iterate the update, uh, you can see that the synchronization the approach gives some kind of the more realistic the outputs like this. Uh, especially for the SDS, we see some kind of the some strong bias of the, the colors, as you can see here, uh, typically based on some kind of the high weights of the CFG. Uh, then we typically get this kind of some sort of the, some bias in the colors. And also for the iterative updates, for some of the cases, like it looks okay, uh, but we start to rotate the object, then we can see some kind of the artifacts in terms like making some kind of the seams uh, as some kind of the point like this. More examples that you can see that you no, know, you can see some kind of the patches of the 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 colors here, right? Some images here, so which is like failing to basically remove all the things. While the synchronization can uh, generate some kind of more like the you know smoother the outputs uh, across the views. The same uh, approach can be also applied not only for the mesh textures but also the Gaussian split textures as well. And some more examples here. So now this looks good, right? So this synchronization looks like good in terms of that it can produce some kind of the better the outputs. But also what we can see is that especially like compared to SDS, uh, is that actually synchronization gives some kind of the better results uh, compared to the SDS, 
only when we can have some kind of strong deep conditions. So basically what we can see in those kind of cases is that these are some of the results that we are reversing some kind of the depth conditioned uh, diffusion models. So what we can basically see is that uh, since we want to generate the images that are aligned with the, the silhouette of the shapes or some kind of the, the depth of the, the shapes, uh, what we can do is that we can first render the depth image of the 3D object from each of the view and use that depth image as some kind of the condition in the control lab. Uh, so those are all the cases that we are taking the depth images uh, from each of the views as the condition and using the control lab uh, to produce the, the textures. So those are basically the cases that we are basically having the very strong deep condition uh, for each of the view. And based on that, we can get some kind of some strong deep guidance in terms of like, uh, what's the output images that we want to get. But if we do not have this kind of some strong deep conditions, then the synchronization may fail to converge and basically still produce some kind of scenes. Uh, so this can be like one limitations. And since like all the synchronizations are uh, required to have some kind of strong deep conditions uh, for the final outputs, like the depth images, uh, it cannot be directly applied for some kind of 3D generation, uh, which is the case that the geometry is not given, but we are basically generating the geometry itself like from scratch uh, without having any kind of conditions. So those are some kind of examples that we are generating the panoramic images uh, without the, any depth conditions. So without having this kind of like strong deep conditions, uh, we will typically get some kind of results, uh, which can be like more realistic, but fails to basically uh, remove all the seams, making the smooth the outputs. And compared to that, what we can get with the SDS is that uh, SDS basically produces like you know, less like uh, there's some seamless outputs like this, uh, and while basically making the whole the output looks like less realistic. So you can see there are some kind of the pros and the cons. Like SDS can be good in terms of achieving some more the consistency and coherency across the all the views, uh, while basically you know uh, compromising the basically the the reality uh, in the outputs. Uh, but if you have some kind of the strong the conditions like the depth images uh, for each of the cases, then we can consider basically using the synchronization uh, in a way that we can achieve some kind of the better uh, the realistic the the more realistic outputs. Uh, while also achieving the consistency as well. So these are some kind of the comparison between the synchronization and also the SDS. Any questions on this? So, so far we have discussed the idea in terms of how we can utilize the pre-trained uh, diffusion model without any kind of the fine tuning to produce like many other things, right? Uh, using the either SDS or the synchronization. So the last topic that we are going to discuss for today is basically how we can also fine tune uh, the given the diffusion models in terms of that we can also improve this kind of the, uh, the you know, the quality of the outputs of the joint diffusion the process. So here the question is that how we can also fine tune the some pre-trained image diffusion model, like for example, like stable diffusion, uh, in terms of that we can also improve the quality of the panoramic images or the mesh textures uh, in the uh, joint diffusion the process. And uh, interestingly, uh, for that we are going to utilize the same approach of the control lab. So do you remember like what we discussed for the control lab? The, the approach of the control net was basically the fine tune the pre-trained model uh, using some kind of the much smaller the data set. Uh, so for the, some typical, the, uh, some conditional degeneration, the image generation, uh, we use some kind of the tens of the thousands of the images, the pairs of the prompts and the images, uh, while the, the, the original, the, the image diffusion model has been trained with the billions of the images, right? So here we want to do the same thing. Uh, we want to fine tune some kind of pre-trained stable diffusion or some kind of the image diffusion models uh, with the much smaller the data set for the panoramic images or the texture images. And also uh, adding some kind of the few additional some loadable the parameters uh, into the pre-trained model while bridging uh, most of the parameters in the given the neural network. So here the question is that how we can introduce some kind of the additional the parameters uh, into the noise prediction the network uh, in a way that we can fine tune those things uh, using the small scale the data set, right? And here for that, like we are going to use the same the zero convolution the idea. So zero convolution was basically nothing but basically introducing the two the parameters, 
uh, that has been that will be applied to the all the basically the outputs in the the neural network uh, with the the one one by one deconvolution, uh, which basically means that we are uh, using the same the scaling and offset parameter the a and the b the scale of the numbers uh, into the all the outputs in the neural net, right? While initializing these two parameters into with the zero, and the idea of the control net was basically uh, basically encapsulating the each of the layer in the neural network uh, with the basically padding the geo convolution. So before or the after and the, the each of the neural the the the, the, uh, the layer, uh, we are adding the geo convolution in a way that we are introducing the two parameters uh, for each of the cases. So having like one geo convolution uh, before the neural network, the, the each of the layer, and also the another digital convolution after the layer, right? So this was basically the very simple the idea that we are injecting some kind of the uh, new parameters uh, to be tuned uh, with some kind of additional the, the, the data set. So while we basically keep this, uh, what we are also going to assume for this specific case is that uh, we are going to assume the case that we have some kind of the pre-specified the mapping uh, between the instance and the chemical species. And based on that, we are also going to assume that the correspondence uh, across the pixels across the instance images is also predefined. So given this kind of the predefined correspondence across the pixels in the across the instant images, what we are going to do is that uh, we are going to introduce some kind of the new module, uh, which is called the correspondence aware the attention module. So what we can see is that uh, let's say like this the left most part. Uh, is basically uh, showing some kind of the architecture of the noise prediction the network of the stable diffusion, having some kind of the multiple D layers uh, in the, the unit, right? So given this kind of like pre-trained uh, the, the, the noise prediction the network, uh, for each of the layer, uh, we are going to add this cross uh, attention the, uh, the module, which is basically conducting some kind of the cross attention across the instance images uh, based on the, the given the information about the correspondence of the pixels. So all the yellow parts are some kind of the new components, which is basically the uh, correspondence attention uh, aware, cross, correspondence aware, the cross attention the module. You can see those kind of things. So how we are basically defining this kind of the correspondence aware, the cross attention the module, uh, for that, like if we see this kind of the diagram here, uh, let's see that like this uh, pixel S is like one of the pixel in this specific instance space. Uh, and we know that this pixel is basically mapped to this point uh, in the another the instance, the image here. So let's say like this is the else, the instance space. And then this pixel S here is mapped to the TL point, this point here. And NTL here, uh, this basically means the set of the all the other J's of the pixels. Uh, you know, near basically this point, which is basically mapped to from the, the pixel S here. And then using some kind of the uh, each of the layer in, in the unit, uh, we are also calculating the features uh, for the, all the pixels. And what we are basically doing is that we simply basically compute the cross attention uh, using some kind of the, uh, the some small layer, the, the shallow net the layer, which is calculating the query key and value. So given the feature of the, the pixel S here, we compute the query. And for all the basically the neighbor the pixels uh, near the TL here, the corresponding the pixel here, uh, we are also calculating the key and the values. And then based on that, we are basically calculating the uh, the attention here and taking the, uh, we are basically taking the softness here. Right? So you can see that this is basically nothing but this is like very typical, the, uh, so the attention module while taking the query from the, the pixel S here and taking the key and the values from the corresponding the pixels, the neighbors of the corresponding the point here. So this is the basic idea for the correspondence aware the cross attention. And what we do is that uh, while we are basically adding some of the zero convolution, the, uh, the operation before and the after each of the layer of the neural network, we additionally basically uh, inject this correspondence or the attention the model here. Uh, in terms of that, we also uh, do some kind of the inverse the communication uh, across the, the given the instance images, uh, given some kind of the correspondence information. So you can see that this is kind of like very similar with like what we have uh, discussed for the control net uh, in terms of that we are basically adding the, the zero convolution layers here. 
uh, while basically adding some kind of the extra the component, uh, which is the correspondence of aware uh, the cross attention. So kind of like simple the idea, but basically while uh, after adding this and fine tune the neural network, uh, now we can see much better quality of the outputs like this kind of the panoramic images. So for those kind of the long the, the prompt, now we can see some like much realistic the uh, some panoramic images. And we can also get some kind of results for the some cart style the images and also some kind of oil painting the images like this. And can you guess some kind of the, some pros and cons for this specific method? So what is some kind of the pros and the cons for this type of the, some fine tuning based method? Any thoughts? Really compared to the some you no. Know, Zero shot method without any fine tuning, uh, what would be some kind of the pros and the cons for the fine tuning based based methods? Yep, so as you many of you also posted on the Slack, yeah, this will basically take some more basically the resource for the generation. Uh, and also, but basically the good thing is that this will be able to produce some better results because like it's like fine-tuning uh based on the given the panoramic the images. And also, but the, the downside is that basically it will take some more the cost for the generation. And also uh the kind of the biggest kind of the drawback is that it requires the fine-tuning. Uh, for each case of like having the canonical and the instance based the, the mapping. So it, it basically this means that uh, if we want to produce some kind of the mesh detector images, uh, we need to basically fine tune the network for each mesh, uh, for each basically the mapping between the canonical and the instances, the spaces, uh, because you can see that the cross attention is basically conducted based on the correspondence uh, across the, the pixels uh, of the, the inst uh, different instance images. Uh, so this is really the problem in terms of that the fine tuning should be done uh, not for some kind of the, the, the general the cases, but the specific the mapping between the canonical and the instance spaces. And what we also have observed in the control net the case is that actually the control net uh, generalizes quite well. So even for some kind of the unseen, some kind of the, the condition, uh, the control net uh, often basically produces some kind of the realistic outputs. So we can also see that this kind of the fine tuning based method also produce some good results, but as the kind of the condition is basically, it's not basically something that has not been seen during the fine tuning, uh, the output can be some kind of the unrealistic, as you can see for those kind of cases. So for example, like for the case that like when we fine tune the uh, diffusion model with some kind of the indoor CND images, uh, if we basically test uh, the, the fine tuned model for some kind of the, the prompt describing some outdoor scenes, uh, we can still get some kind of the outputs, but the output becomes slightly less realistic. So for those kind of the out of domain the, the cases, actually we can consider using not the fine tuned model, but the Geoshati method like the, the synchronization. So those are some kind of the uh, some pros and the cons uh, for the fine tuning based method. Okay. Any questions on this? So those are like all the very practical the ideas in terms of like how we can uh, utilize some kind of pre-trained diffusion models for the um, to produce like many other things. And next time, the next week, uh, we are also going to discuss another topic, uh, which is about the inverse problems for also for some kind of the conditional degeneration. And then we are also going to move on to some more like the theoretic the topics, uh, which is about the uh, the you know different way to basically run the university process. And also we're gonna to start to discuss the flow-based model as well. 
And for the next Wednesday, uh, we're going to have the session for the assignment five, uh, which will be about basically implementing the synchronization and see you also compare the outputs with the SDS. So I'm going to see you next Wednesday. And if you have any questions on this, uh, please uh, let us know on Slack. Okay, thank you. I will see you next Wednesday.